Hey, welcome to another video from Skinny Medic. It's October the 15th, 2015, and American Heart Association just released their new 2015 guidelines. They release new guidelines every five years to help guide us, healthcare providers, in providing better uh, CPR, cardiac arrest management for our patients that go into cardiac arrest. They provide evidence-based uh, medicine so we can help improve our outcomes for patients who go into cardiac arrest. So I'll put a link down below in the description for this document here. It's, it's a pretty lengthy document, but I wanted to do a video and just kind of give you the highlights of the new updates for 2015. There's not a huge dramatic change, but there are some changes that I really like, so we'll go through them. Uh, one of the things you're going to see is the chain of survival, you know, out of hospital versus in hospital chain of survival. One of the things I noticed was that the uh, surveillance and prevention, you know, if we can prevent these patients from going to cardiac arrest, obviously that makes a huge difference because they never, their heart never stops. So if we can trend them, trend the vital signs, and see that they're crashing, then we can uh, uh, stop that and you know, stop them from going to cardiac arrest so they never actually go into cardiac arrest, which would help our outcomes. One of the things you're going to still see is the CAB. Uh, if you're OCD, sorry about that. It's not ABC. It's still CAB. Um, and they've also increased for adult patients the cardiac arrest uh, for the compressions is 100 to 120. You know, it used to be they say at least 100 beats a minute. We were, we we're doing chest compressions. Now they've upped it so we can go up to 120. We're seeing good outcomes with that as well. And they said that your chest compressions need to be two inches. And your depth needs to be two inches, but no greater than 2.4. So two, two and a half inches is your guideline there, but come completely off the chest when you're doing chest compressions. The other thing I thought was interesting was Narcan for opiate overdose. You know, they said you know, obviously don't delay doing good quality BLS CPR with defibrillation, but we can give Narcan for patients in cardiac arrest. Another thing that they, they talk about is AED versus CPR. You know, if you obviously if you have an AED right there, get it on immediately. But if you don't have an AED, send for it, call for help, call 911, and start chest compressions. There were apparently some questions about that previously about what you should do first. So once the AED gets there, immediately apply the plaids, pads, and then let it analyze. You know, if their patient's in a shockable rhythm, then we need to de apply defibrillation. With that being said, they've actually delayed ventilations for patients that are in a shockable rhythm. So if your patient is in a shockable rhythm, you can delay ventilations for up to three cycles, 200 compressions. So we can delay that just a little bit. So yeah, by, by using strategy up to three cycles, 200 continuous compressions with passive ventilations. So you can delay the uh, ventilations if your patient's in a shockable rhythm. So good CPR, defibrillation, kind of downplay the ventilation at least for the first few minutes and then hopefully we're going to see better results with that. Uh, impedance devices, we actually still use impedance devices at my service that I work for and it actually says there's no really evidence support they work so uh, you may see that kind of go down. Mechanical ventilation devices, it says there's no evidence that demonstrate benefit of using mechanical Piston devices for chest compressions versus manual chest compressions patients in cardiac arrest. So obviously someone putting hands on the chest, uh, they're showing is just as good as doing piston devices. So that's cool. Uh, it does talk about lidocaine. It says it doesn't obviously recommend routine use of lidocaine, but it does bring up lidocaine for some of the old school paramedics that watch my video. For our ROS patients, patients that we get spontaneous uh, return of circulation back, it says the routine pre-hospital cooling of patients with rapid infusion of cold IV fluids after ROS is not recommended. So um, that's interesting, something you're going to see change there. It goes over the opiate overdose. There again, don't delay good quality CPR, good compressions and defibrillations, but you can give Narcan. For pediatrics, still the same uh, compression rate, 100 to 120 a minute. And it says strongly reaffirming that compressions and ventilations are needed for pediatric BLS. For adult patients, we've kind of said, you know what, hands-only CPR works. Um, you know, we can kind of downplay the airway. But for peds, you've got a good, good, good ventilation, good chest rise and fall. For adults, we typically go into cardiac arrest because we have bad hearts. We've ate bad, we don't exercise. And we all number things, hypertension, diabetes, but we have bad hearts. P 
Peds typically still have good hearts. They go into cardiac arrest because of airway and respiratory issues. So going back to getting good ventilation, good chest rise and fall on peds is important. I did see that they've actually kind of, there's two algorithms now for pediatric cardiac arrest, one with one rescuer and the second one is multiple rescuers. And they actually did bring up using a cell phone, which I thought was interesting that, you know, finally they said, you know, hey, let's pick up the cell phone and call 911. Um, there again, comp compression only uh, for adults and then for peds, you know, we can, you know, still make sure we're getting good airway ventilations there. Going through to the first aid section now, um, I am I'm a big fan of PHTLS, the TCCC, uh, I like the trauma stuff. So one of the things they talk about in their first aid section was a first aid provider caring for an individual with open chest wound may leave the wound open. If dressing or direct pressure are adequate to, to stop the bleeding, care must be taken to ensure that the blood saturation dressing does not become occlusive. So they've really kind of downplayed occlusive dressings for chest wounds now. They said that it's more likely to build up a tension pneumothorax, which we know is life-threatening. So they've kind of downplayed that. The other thing they, they downplayed a little bit was aspirin, which I was kind of interesting reading. That obviously that if the first, first aid uh, care provider believes that this is cardiac in nature, believes the patient's having MI, absolutely give them aspirin. But if they're not sure or they're uncomfortable giving aspirin, you really don't have to. It says, that the, um, I'll read it. It says, while waiting for EMS arrival, the first aid provider may encourage a person with chest pain to chew one adult or two low dose aspirin if the signs and symptoms suggest the person is having a myocardial infarction, which is an MI, and if the person has no allergy or other contraindication to aspirin. If a person having chest pain does not suggest a cardiac source or the first aid provider is uncertain of the cause of chest pain or uncomfortable administering aspirin, then the first aid provider should not encourage the person to take uh, take aspirin and decision to, can be delayed for EMS providers. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, hemostatic agents are mentioned here as well in the first aid section. It says that if you can't control bleeding with direct pressure or with typical normal galls that you can do hemostatic agents as well there. Hemostatic dressings. The other thing too you're going to see is the um, spine motion spine motion restriction uh, here. So if, for those of you guys who do put people on KEDs along spine boards, you know if you do it right, that's a great torture device. So you're going to kind of see that, you know, maybe we don't necessarily have to put everybody on a long spine board. That we can, you know, not just downplay that a little bit. And, you know, just lay them supine. That's one of the things we're seeing here is, you know, just putting a seat collar and laying people supine. You actually do a lot less movement of the spine. So it says, the growing body of evidence showing uh, harm and no good evidence showing clear benefit routine application of of cervical collars by first aid providers is not recommended. So these patients that are along spine board can actually start to develop ulcers, bed sores, uh, wounds very quickly by being compressed on a long spine board, especially your elderly patients. If they've got the curved spine and we're laying them flat on a hard plastic board, it can be very uncomfortable for them. So those are the quick updates, the ones that I scrolled through, the ones I highlighted. I'll put a link down below for you guys to read the article entirely if you want to. So if you haven't taken a CPR class recently, I strongly encourage you to do it. Uh, we're seeing huge increases in our survivability rates for patients in cardiac arrest. So you can truly save a life by learning CPR. You never know when it might be a loved one that you save. So thank you guys for watching. You never know when you'll be the first responder. Remember, you need the right gear and the right training.